Harper, and I had an opportunity to hear him preach at our BB Church of the Nazarene, and he spoke from this text, and I had never thought about it or seen it uh, the way that he presented it, and I've actually gone back and re-listened to that sermon, and I've got a couple points, like if you hear me talk about things that sound way smarter than I usually do, that is compliments of Dr. Graves and, uh, and his outstanding preaching on this text. We're talking about what it means to be disciplined disciples, and that word discipline is kind of one of those that gives us a little bit of a bad taste in our mouth sometimes, but that's not what the writer is talking about here. When we hear discipline in this context, I don't want you to think about all the times you got grounded when you were a kid because you did something bad. Uh, Remember last week we said discipline is not a bad word. We're not talking about about that kind of uh, corrective discipline. It's not discipline that's punishment that we're talking about. We're talking about a kind of developmental discipline that God places in our lives so that we can grow grow and mature to become the people that he has created us to be. This discipline is not the, why why did you do that, now you're grounded kind of discipline. This discipline is more like the, no, you cannot stay up until 2 o'clock in the morning and eat a whole pack of Oreos while you watch a rated R movie on TV, 11-year-old child, okay? This is the kind of discipline that is like, hey, your parent loved you enough to create some boundaries for you so that hopefully they had an end in mind for the person that you would become. And ultimately, God has the ultimate end in mind. He knows the full redemptive potential of who we could be when we live our lives in Christ, when we surrender ourselves to him so that we can be filled with and transformed by the power of his Holy Spirit. God is developing and maturing us and growing us in holiness towards Christ likeness. And in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 7, we're encouraged to endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline ever seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So therefore... Strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one can see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. See that no one is sexually immoral immoral, or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit his blessing, he was rejected. Even though he sought the blessing with tears, he could not change what he had Done. We're going to talk about Esau next week, but this week I want to focus on this word holiness that pops up over and over and over again as we read through this passage. You know that is the, that is the aim of life in Christ, is that we would be holy people, that we would pursue Christ's likeness, that as we follow him, we wouldn't just gain information about him, but we would learn to live and to love and to act and to serve just like Jesus. That process of growing in Christ likeness, so I look less and less like the fleshy, fallen, sinful version of myself, and I look more and more like a spirit filled, Christ-like man that God created me to be. That's what the aim of holiness is in our lives. This week I was reminded of some research from a guy named George Barna, and you've probably heard of George Barna. He's been doing church research for many years, but, but a few years ago, back in 2011, he did a study, and he ended up publishing this study in a book called Maximum Faith, Live Like Jesus. And, and what the Barna Research Group did is they had 15,000 phone conversations with individuals all over the country, and their aim was to try to understand how people grow in a relationship with God. 
As a result of this, they created kind of a roadmap for a journey of faith and spiritual transformation with these 10 markers or 10 stops along the way. These are uh, places where people go from completely without faith to like a fully devoted, fully surrendered faith in Christ. I've, I've got the 10 stops for you up on, on the screen here. The first one is that people begin and they are completely unaware of their sin. They have no idea what that concept is, why it's a problem, that it's even a situation that they need to be worried about. They're just, they just don't know. And then the second stop is that there's an indifference to sin. And maybe you've heard, hey, there's, there's sin in your life. It's, it's, it's a willful transgression of a known law of God. It's when you do the opposite of what he desires or you don't do the things that he wants. And they're like, eh, whatever. And they, they just don't care. They're just indifferent to it. There's, there's another step as we go, and, and that's when that, that seed begins to plant in our life, and, and we're worried that, man, if, if sin really is a problem, and if it truly does separate us from God, then, then I don't know if I want that in my life. It, that, that might be something that I need to address, and that moves us on to the next stage. This is that, that act of salvation where we place our faith in Christ. We repent of our sin. We're forgiven of our sin. We receive new life, and, uh, and, and that's that, that moment of confession where we turn towards him, and, and then we become forgiven, and we begin to actively live out a life of faith. Oftentimes, that means we're involved in Christian community. You, maybe you were far from God. At one point, you didn't care about sin. You learned about it. You, you started to feel bad about it. It, you cried out to God to forgive you of your sin, and, and then maybe you get plugged in in the life of a church. You're, you're living out some version of Christian faith. And this is the, the first half of this, and then it goes on, and there's another step. There's another step where there's a holy discontent. And it's this feeling that's like, man, I know that, that Jesus is a part of my life. I know that God is up to something, but I just, I just have a hunger for more. I feel like there's, there's got to be more for this. And that leads us to the next step where there's another breakthrough moment where, where we're broken by God, where we, we look at our life and we're like, I know he has some of me, but I really want him to have all of me. I want to I fully surrender everything to him. I want to lay my pride aside and allow him not just to be my savior, but also the Lord, the leader, the king king, the, the guide, the director. He want, I want him to call the shots in my life. It, it, it leads us to this place of full surrender and full submission. That now I don't just want to give God the bad stuff in my life that, that I feel terrible about or that I'm embarrassed by or maybe I bear the scars of from my past. I don't just give him the bad stuff. I give him the good stuff in my life as well. He has all of me. That should lead us to the place where we have a profound love of God, this all-consuming love that the Bible talks about, that love for God with heart, with soul, with mind, with strength, so that all of our being is really devoted to a fully surrendered, radical, spirit-filled, spirit-fueled kind of love for God. And when we have that kind of love, we can't help but share it with others. And so it's marked by this profound love of people. And it's not just like, oh, I think people are great. It's like, man, I know that God has called me to people who are far from him, and I want to give my life in service to the kingdom and to the king, to this God that I love profoundly and wholeheartedly so that I can make a difference in the lives of other people. These were the markers that Barna came up with on this journey. And, and then he gave a percentage to where people fall in all of these different things. Now, remind, I want to remind you that, that this could be a little bit outdated. I think there's a couple of factors that inform these percentages because I know you're already looking at them. On, on the one hand, this is old research. So if you had to guess if the numbers were pushing towards the top of the page or towards the bottom of the page, which percentage numbers are going up? It's the, t the top of the page. And, and then when we look at the bottom of the page, I'm, I'm really hopeful that those percentages might actually be stronger because when you truly do have a holy disconsent, you've been broken by God, you live a surrendered and submitted life, you have profound love for him and the profound love of people, what that should generate in you is a kind of holy humility that actually causes you to downplay that second half of your life because you don't want to be perceived as prideful. So my hope is that, man, maybe more of us are experiencing this, this bottom half, but, but on the top half, like people who don't have any idea that sin's even a thing, that's just 1%. And the people who completely know about it and could care less about it, maybe they're completely atheistic, completely humanistic, just I don't even believe that God is real, I don't care, 16%. The number of people who are, are genuinely worried about the stuff in their life that they feel like could separate them from God in 2011, 39%. People who are living where it's like, hey, I'm forgiven of sin, but I haven't really done anything with it, that came in at 9%. 
people who are forgiven and living some form of active faith, maybe it's church attendance, maybe it's Bible reading, something that's a marker of someone who's living a life of faith, that's at, that's at 24%. And then the numbers plummet dramatically when you get to the bottom of this. And the, the people who have that holy discontent that's like, man, I am longing for more in my life. I want more of him. The people who have truly been broken by God, that's 6% and 3%. And the ones who that discontent and that brokenness has led them to a place of full surrender, this is where it gets crazy. 1% of those surveyed. And then when we get down to this profound love of God that actually shapes who we are, how we think, how we live, what we do, half, 0.5%. And to get to all the way to the, to the very lowest level, it's another 0.5%, probably the same 0.5% as, as above, because profound love for God results in us profoundly loving those around us and those that he has called us to as well. And I know we've got some, some mathematicians in the room, but if you add all of this up, this top half adds up to 89% of people that fall in the first half of the progression on this journey of faith, the first five stops. And the second five stops, what we would maybe identify as, as a full surrender, as a holy life, a life that is wholly pursuing God with everything that we are, where he is taking our brokenness and making us whole, marked by surrender, profound love for God, and profound love for others. It's 11% that live on that second half, where it's not just Jesus has saved me from my sins so that I can go to heaven when I die, it's this Jesus is radically working in my life right here, right now, so that heaven can break in, in and through. It's just, just 11% of people. E even more alarming is if you take these bottom three stops, a full surrender and submission, a deep and profound love of God that consumes our life, and a profound love of people that affects how we actually go and love and serve, it's, it's 2% all the way down at the bottom. And if that was 12 years ago, I believe we see the numbers on the top going up and the numbers at the bottom either stable or maybe even going down. Barna, in his book, Maximum Faith, that he wrote where he published all of this work, he wrote this. He said, merely believing that Jesus is God and that he lived on earth and exists today is not enough. The Bible tells us that even Satan believes those things Saying we've made a commitment to Christ and living in ways that demonstrate that commitment are two different realities. Claiming to be saved because of having said a prayer, asking for forgiveness while continuing to live without a dramatic change of heart is not the same as seeking forgiveness and turning that forgiven heart over to the one who extended that forgiveness. He's saying life is very different on the first five stops than it is in the bottom half of that equation. And, and here's what I want us to know. God has designed us. He has created us. Not just to be forgiven of sin so that we can go to heaven when we die. But he has created us so that we can encounter him and be transformed in the likeness of Christ. So that we can be what the Bible talks about. Sanctified, renewed, refined, purified, and empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that is the good stuff that happens in the second half of our life. That is a life of holiness. And church, here's what I want you to know today. Holiness is God's desire for you. And that is not bad news. That is good news. Like if we got to choose, what, what is it that we want from God? I think we would say, man, I want my life to work. I want it to come together. I want everything to click. I want to experience the fullness of his blessing. I don't want bad things to happen, and I would love it if you could make some good things happen. And really, the life that we would describe for what we want from God is what I would call a life that's really happy. Like, like we want God to, to, to be involved in our life so that he can make us feel good and so that the bad stuff will stay away. And, and we think that the aim for God in our life should be happiness. But God's aim in your life is not happiness. His aim is holiness. And what does that mean? It means that unhappy things are going to happen in your life. And when unhappy things do happen, God uses them to produce holiness in and through your life. The aim in his life is happiness, is wholeness, not happiness. And how many of you grew up in a household where the goal for your parents was not that you would be happy 100% of the time, but that you would grow into a healthy and whole human being? 
How many of you would say, my parents were more concerned about wholeness than they were with happiness? And it's the same for our Heavenly Father. I love it when my kids are happy. I love it when I get the opportunity to say yes to them. I love it when they ask me for something and I'm like, absolutely, that would be awesome. Let's go there. Let's do that thing. Let's buy that thing. Let's get that thing. You eat that thing, whatever it is, right? But oftentimes, in my wisdom, I'm able to look at them and say, man, I know that that's not good. I know that the timing isn't right. I know that that's not a healthy thing in your life. I know you think that that's going to make you happy, but ultimately, the happiness that you're going to experience for a moment is going to fade, and that thing will actually end up being detrimental in your life. And your parents did the same thing. That's why when you ask them things, oftentimes you heard the answer, no. And it wasn't what you wanted to hear, and it wasn't because they were against you, it was because they loved you. And that's why sometimes they ask you to do things that you didn't want to do. And sometimes they ask you to do things that were really, really hard. And it didn't make you happy that they asked you to do that, but it was part of you growing and developing into who you have become. There were times when you were awful as a kid. I know some some of us have multiple generations in the church, and I've heard the stories about awful things you did. And there was corrective things that had to be done because of that. That's why your parents corrected bad behavior because they were more concerned with your wholeness than your happiness. That's why they set boundaries for you. They didn't just launch you out into the world and say, good luck, figure it out, have fun, be happy, it's going to be amazing. But man, they did everything they could to, to guide you, to direct you, to watch over you, to protect you, sometimes even to come alongside and, and to defend you in moments because they weren't just trying to make you happy, happy, happy all the time. They were trying to help you grow and develop in maturity. They wanted you to have a certain level of self-discipline so that when they did launch you into the world, you would not be overwhelmed by a world that is not a happy world all the time. And because the world is not happy all the time, it requires some hardiness for us from a human perspective, but because it's not a happy world, it's a fallen, broken, sinful world that we live in, what it requires for us is not that we would be happy and not even that we would be hardy or tough enough to overcome it, but that we would be holy, that we would be focused on Christ, that we would be becoming more like him as we follow him and pursue him and live our life to make much of him. And here's the great thing. When, when happiness is the aim of life, we very rarely stumble into holiness, I'm going to say that again. When happiness is the aim of your life, it's unusual that you would stumble into holiness. But when holiness is the aim of your life, what you find is there's actually more happiness there than you ever would have imagined. Because it, the happiness comes and goes, but, but even on the days when the happiness is gone, when you don't feel like, oh man, what a wonderful day, the weather's awesome, and I lost weight, and I get to do amazing things today. Like, like even when that's not the story, you still get to live your life daily from a place where you have joy because you have Jesus because you're pursuing him and growing in him, and that's what the holy life is actually all about. Jesus is more concerned with your wholeness than your happiness, but here's the thing that you need to know. Holiness doesn't happen fast. It happens slow. Holiness is a harvest. We've talked about this concept some. In fact, even when Pastor Brian talked about parenting a couple of weeks ago, he had this line, and he said, you don't cram for a crop, you plan for a crop. And it's the same thing when we talk about holiness. You can't cram holiness into your life, but you can open up your life and allow God to plant seeds of faith in your life that will be nurtured and developed through his discipline, through his guidance, through his provision in your life. And those seeds of faith that are planted over time, if we pay attention to them, eventually will produce a harvest in our life. He talks about this in in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11. It says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time. It's painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. A harvest of righteousness and peace in church, what I would call that, is a harvest of holiness. God says, I am holy, and I want you to be holy because I am holy. And in your flesh, and in your fallenness, and in your sinfulness, you can't produce that. But by my Spirit, I can grow and develop those things in you. And it might take some time. It might take some attention. It might take some nurturing, and it might take some intentionality. This is where where discipline begins to come into our life. How many of you have ever known someone who was a farmer? Anybody? Anybody ever hear that farmer just talk about how easy farming was all the time? 
What a blessing it was when the weather didn't go the way that it was supposed to, right? When it was time to bring the crop in, they were like, pretty easy day, get to reap a harvest today, going to be real simple, real straightforward, real easy out there. Everybody I've ever known that's in agriculture talks about how hard the work is, how devoted to the work you have to be, how much discipline it requires, how eventually you do it because you're disciplined and you love the hard work. But over time, that discipline develops a desire, and then you fall in love with it, and farmers don't want to do anything except for farm, even though it's like the hardest work you can do in the world because they've been devoted to the discipline and it's stirred up a desire and now that's what they want to do holiness is the work of the spirit inside of us that we can't control but it's also the hard work that he calls us to do as we live not by the flesh but we live by the spirit and we intentionally live with focus on him so that we can experience the life that he has for us And if you've been a part of a Nazarene church for a long time, you've heard all this stuff before, right? If you grew up in the church of the Nazarene, holiness is kind of the thing that we've always talked about. It's always been like kind of our distinct reason that we feel like God has put the church of the Nazarene on the planet is because we want to call people to live that holy life. Because we think that there's actually more in the second half of that list that we saw before than there is on the first half. That that all the good stuff, it doesn't exist before you become a Christian or even at the moment when you become a Christian, all the best stuff is actually in the bottom half of that list. The best stuff is the holy discontent. The best stuff is that sense of brokenness. The best stuff is when I find out I don't have to live for myself anymore, but I can live for him and I can fall holy profoundly and completely in love with God. And when that happens, all of a sudden I have a love for people around me who I never even liked before, but now... Now I have the opportunity to love them as God has loved me and called me to share that love with the world. The best stuff is in the bottom half of that list. And the Church of the Nazarene has kind of always been about this idea that, man, God wants to do a deeper work in you. He he wants to forgive you of your sin, but he also wants to transform your life. And and as as I've grown up in the Church of the Nazarene, and some of you have grown up in the Church of the Nazarene, you've heard a a lot of sermons about holiness, and and we've used different language at different times, and sometimes it even sounds like we're talking about different things. Because when we we talk about holiness, there's there's what what Dr. Busick calls a dialectical tension, and he had to explain that to me. It's this idea that there are these two things that seem like opposites. They don't seem like they go together. But they are opposites, but they live in tension with each other, and they balance each other. And as long as they're balanced and the tension is good, it's true. But when you get things out of balance, all of a sudden it starts to break apart and it doesn't really work anymore. Let let me give you just a a couple of examples, and there are more than this. But when we talk about holiness, here's one one of the things that you need to know about holiness, is that holiness is instantaneous and it's progressive. <laughs> You're like, oh man, this is the most boring sermon Pastor Tim has ever preached. Holiness is simultaneously instantaneous and progressive. If you've been around the Church of the Nazarene, sometimes we use the words holiness or sanctification is a crisis, and it's also a process. It's something that happens in an instant and in a moment, but it's also something that happens in a lifetime of faithful service and transformation as the Spirit of God does its work inside of you. It's right now, and it's also to be continued. Let let, let me explain it this way. If holiness is a harvest, there's a moment when the farmer needs to put some seeds into the ground, but when the farmer puts the seed into the ground, that seed is planted, but that seed also isn't ready to be harvested. That seed needs to grow, that seed needs to be nurtured, that seed needs to mature before it can produce the fruit that it was created to produce. And the same thing is true for us when we talk about holiness. I think about my own experience all the way back when I was a teenager around 15 years old and man I have loved Jesus since I was born I made my faith personal when I was in seventh grade when I was 12 years old I made a personal decision to trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sin I admitted that I was a sinner I confessed all that I repented and man I was excited about being a Christian and then I came home and my parents were the same they've always been and my friends at school were the same that they've always been 
And what I started to find out was, man, I've got a personal relationship with Jesus, but I also kind of feel like I'm the, I'm the same that I've always been. And my friends still make bad decisions, and it sounds fun, and my parents are still frustrating and annoying, and that God, Jesus needs to work on them if he wants to work on me, right? Because I, I had experienced some of that, but not all of that. And, and I kind of rode a roller coaster of faith that my relationship with Jesus felt as strong as my last emotional encounter that I had with him. And so I was up and down all the time, and I kind of got tired of it. By the time I was like a sophomore or junior, I was like, is this it? I had that, that, that holy discontent that, that, that Barna talked about. I knew that there had to be more. And in that moment, I was at a winter retreat. I bowed, and I was like, Lord, if this is all that there is to being a Christian, riding an emotional roller coaster of ups and downs, I don't know if I want that. But if there's more, I want it. And I look back on that moment, and it was a moment where I said, God, here's all that sinful stuff that I give you every Sunday when there's a good sermon preached and I go to the altar. Here, here's all the bad stuff. But God, here's all my good stuff too. Here's my hopes and dreams for my future. Here's the little bit of stuff that I've accomplished at this early part of my life. You can have all of me and do whatever you want. And you know what happened? I was wholly sanctified in that moment. There was something different that happened inside of me that I got sick and tired of living by my own power, by my own strength, by my own direction. Some people use this language where it's like, hey, you've let Jesus be in the passenger seat of your car, and now you invite him to move over, and he gets to be in the driver's seat. He gets to decide the direction. He gets to decide where you're going and when you're going and how you're going, and you are along for the journey. And as you're along for the journey, you become more like him. And church, here's the crazy thing. Holiness is instantaneous. I was wholly sanctified on that day. But here's another reality. I am also wholly sanctified on this day 30 years later. In fact, hopefully I am more fully sanctified today than I was 35 years ago as a 15-year-old kid who made some kind of surrender that I didn't fully understand. So what have I been doing for the last 30 years? I've been walking with Jesus day by day. I've been making progress, hopefully most days, and there have been some setbacks, there have been some things that I regret, there have been some things that I would absolutely do differently, but I look at where I am now on a relationship with Jesus and my understanding of who he is and how he lived and who I am and who he's calling me to be and how he has created me to live, that has grown and developed and matured over time. And the Spirit has continued to work in my life, and the same Spirit that sanctified me wholly that day continues to sanctify me wholly right now. And when I was 15, I wanted to live a surrendered life to the best of my ability as I was empowered by the Holy Spirit. And at 45, I want to live a surrendered life to the best of my ability as I'm surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And hopefully... And Nicole's out of town. So absolutely, 45-year-old Tim looks more like Jesus than 15-year-old Tim did, right? And the same is true for you. Let, let me explain it to you another way because sometimes spiritual things, are, are, they're just hard to connect with. We got, we got some married folks in the house, right? You, you remember the day you got married? Like the, the first day? I remember it. June 30th, 2001. I was uh, 23 years old when I got married. And we planned, we were excited, and we, we, we had the wedding, we had the, the reception, and I remember the pastor was like, you got to sign the, the wedding certificate, and we signed to that, and, and, and he said, you, you know, here I present to you Tim and Nicole Britton, and we went to the reception, and everybody was celebrating that, and it was all done, and I can't remember if they threw rice at us, because we used to throw rice at people when they got married. We were like right on the line where people started blowing bubbles, because we realized we were killing all the birds with the rice, you know. We, there was either rice or bubbles, I don't know. Nicole could tell you for sure. I think it was bubbles. And I remember coming out more excited than I'd ever been. And I was like, oh my goodness, I'm so married right now. I am totally married right now. And I was holding Nicole's hand and I was like, we're, we're totally married. We got into a rented 2000 Chrysler Sebring convertible that I had to take back to the airport the next day. And we drove off with the wind in our hair and we were like, whoa, we're married. And I had never been more married than I was in that moment. I had never been married before. But let me tell you something else that's true. I am way more married now than I was that day. <laughs> it's been 22 and a half years. We've had highs and we've had lows. We've bought houses. We have welcomed and then buried pets. 
We have welcomed three children into the world. Our lives have been joined together. We had to go to a furniture store and buy some stuff. Now I just wish we could get rid of some stuff. I'm so much more married now than I was the day that I got married. But on the day I got married, I was totally married. And today I'm totally married still. And it's the same thing with this idea that holiness is instantaneous and it's progressive. The moment you ask the Spirit to sanctify you, you are totally sanctified. Does that mean that the work is done? No, it means that the seed has been planted in your life and the work of God has begun in your life. And as you journey with Him, as you walk with Him, as you surrender to Him, not just one day when you ask the Spirit to come into your life, but every day as you ask the Spirit to continue to fill you and to transform you and to change you, you can be way more wholly sanctified down the road because of the progressive, ongoing work of God. In fact, I don't don't want to get to a place in my life where I feel like God is finished or done with me. I want to experience his ongoing work in my life day by day as I continue to trust in him. It's instantaneous and it's progressive. Here's another one for you. I want to hit this fast. Holiness is also spiritual and it's also practical. In fact, spiritual, we don't really have trouble figuring that out. In fact, as I talk about holiness, for some of you, just that word is intimidating and it feels out of reach and impractical and impossible for you in your life. And you're like, yeah, that holy stuff, that's what the Spirit is supposed to do in my life. You're right, that is what the Spirit is supposed to do. Holiness is intensely, extremely spiritual, but it is also extremely practical. In fact, here's what I want you to know. You... No matter how smart you are, no matter how tough you are, I would even say no matter how godly you think you are, you do not have the ability to produce holiness out of your flesh. Because what your flesh produces is actually sinfulness. But what the Spirit does in your life, the Spirit comes in and it equips you and empowers you to live like Jesus. If you try to live like Jesus on your own, by your own strength, you will be frustrated and exhausted. You can't grit your way into the holy life. You can't fight your way into the holy life. All you can do is surrender your way into the holy life. And when it is the desire of your heart that it would be surrendered to Jesus, that you would have brokenness and surrender, profound love for God, profound love for others, the Spirit moves in in that moment and begins that process as you are sanctified holy, as you are perfected in love of God over time. To be filled with the Spirit is not about you just working harder. The Spirit is at work in your life, but here's what you've got to do. You've got to surrender. You've got to get out of the way. The the spiritual side of it, I guarantee when you ask God to make you holy, He will do what He can do. He will make you as holy as you can be. He will make you as free as you can be. He will make you as pure as you can be. But you have a job in this process as well. It's not just a, I asked God to do it, and now he's going to take care of it. It is, I asked God to do it, and now we, in partnership, are going to do this thing over a lifetime of faithfulness to him. He's going to change my heart. He's going to change my soul. He's going to change my thoughts. He's going to change my habits. He's going to change my attitudes. He's going to change everything about me so that I become more and more like Jesus. But here's the thing. The default mode of your life in a fallen world even when you've prayed a prayer, God, make me holy. If you, pay, if you pray a prayer, God, make me holy. And then you live a life that is not intentional, that isn't disciplined, that isn't focused on something, that isn't just trying to avoid bad stuff, but is actually involved in engaging with the good things that God has created you for. But like, like here's the thing. You can't become more like Jesus if you don't know more about Jesus. You know how you get to know more about Jesus? You hang out with him in his word. You you spend time learning about who he was and how he lived and what he taught. And then you ask, Spirit, I know that you're at work inside of me because you have sanctified me. So reveal to me anywhere in my life that doesn't match up with the life of Jesus. You begin to develop a discipline of being in his word. You know what? You You can't become more like Jesus if you don't ever talk to Jesus. That's why prayer is so important. 
Because through a discipline of prayer, and here's what happens, discipline develops a desire. I'm going to talk more about that later on. Not today, because we're already over time. But discipline develops desire. As you live with discipline, that Bible study that was really hard when you started, it becomes something that you crave. And that prayer that was really awkward when you started, it becomes something that you can't imagine living without, like air, like oxygen, like I've got to have this in my life. I desire for it. I long for it. Why? Because the Spirit is transforming your mind. The Spirit is transforming your heart. The Spirit is transforming your soul. You live in a world that's crazy loud. And so another discipline is like you've got to have moments where you just turn the volume of your life down. You live in a world that's crazy crowded and everybody's demanding of you all the time, especially if you're a parent, like, There's times where you need silence and you need solitude. There's times where you find out that you're hungry for a lot of things that the world has to offer, but the real desire of your heart is that you would hunger for the things of God. That's why fasting is not an obsolete practice for us in 2023. We're in a season of Lent. This would be a great time for you to look at your life and say, Jesus, where do you want to shape me and form me to be more like you? And what is it that you want me to lay down so that I can take up everything that you have for me during this season? The spiritual disciplines are actually means of grace where we experience the grace of God at work work in our life. Holiness is instantaneous and it's progressive. It's spiritual, something only God can do, but it's also, it's also practical. It's something that you have to do as well. I, I thought about this as, as we land and as we wrap up. Some of us have identified this in the life of other people. You've seen sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so and you know about their prayer life and you know the sweetness of your spirit and you're like, I want that. Because you see that thing in, their, in them, like you see Christ's likeness in them. You see what you, what you want to become. And, and here's this thing that's true spiritually and it's true in the world as well. Whoever's public life you admire, they have a private life of discipline. What, what do I mean? I mean like when you go to a movie and you see an actor up there on the screen and they're so dialed in and it's like they've been lost inside a character. They didn't just get a script and show up on set that day and be like, I've got this dialed in. I think I can do it. They put in work to develop into that character that you saw on that screen. You know the athletes that you see on, on your TV when you watch Super Bowl or baseball or basketball or whatever it is that you're into? They didn't just pick up a bat or a glove or a ball or a bike or whatever it is that that, that, that sport is that you admire. They didn't just show up one day and be like, I got this. They disciplined and trained their life to prepare. They practice all the time so that they can get, step onto that stage, onto that platform and be everything that they need to be so that they can win, so that they can be victorious. The same thing is true spiritually. The people that we look at, they didn't just become that on their own. They became that instantaneously over time by the Spirit and with a lot of hard work. And you can too. And some of us need to because some of us are in the top half and we wish we were down there in that bottom half. And we're up in the 89%, and man, we want to be a part of that 11%, or even that, maybe even that 2%, that God is doing something deep and profound and effective and fruitful in and through. This whole section ends with Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, where it says, Make every effort to live at peace with everyone and be holy. You think you can live at peace with everyone by your own strength? That's going to take the Holy Spirit. I can't even live at peace with everybody that agrees with me by my own strength. If you're going to live at peace with everybody, you're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit. Live at peace with everyone and be holy. And some of you feel like you're immediately disqualified because you picture holiness as some idealized version of who you're never going to be with some kind of shiny halo that's all spiffed up and everything's polished off and all the edges are sanded and everything is perfected. It doesn't all have to be perfected. The work of the Holy Spirit is perfecting in your life. And you got to start somewhere. you got to put that seed in the ground. you got to drop that knee in prayer. You've got to make that surrender to the Spirit that gives Him the freedom to begin to move and work to do something deeply significant and life-changing, and then you walk in that and work that out for the rest of your life. Make every effort to live at peace with everyone. And then I love this last verse. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. 
And when I first read that, I think, yep, if I'm not holy, I'm not going to make it. If I'm not holy, I'm not going to be good enough. If I'm not holy, I'm going to get to the gates and they're going to be like, ah, nope, sorry, not holy enough. You don't make it in. Maybe. But, but if I'm supposed to make every effort to live in peace with everyone and be holy, that's the, that's the outward life that I'm supposed to be living. That's what everybody who I come in contact with is supposed to be seeing and experience as they interact with us. They, they see and experience peace and holiness Not the kind of holiness that says, I'm better than you, but the kind of holiness that says, I'm a sinner saved by grace who's been transformed by the grace of God, and you can be too. Why is this important? Because without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And I don't think that means that you're never going to get to heaven, and you're never going to see the Lord. It actually means something even more powerful than that. It means if you don't live the holy life that Jesus has called you to, a world that does not know him, will never see him and never know him. Without your holiness, without you, without God's holiness on display in your life, the world will never see and know him. And that feels grand. Without God's holiness on display in your life, your kids might never see and know him. Your neighbor might never see and know him. The folks in your classroom or your coworkers, they might not ever see and know the Lord without his holiness on display in your life. So then the question is, is the holiness of God on display in your life? And I can't answer that for you. But if you ask him, he'll let you know. And that's what I want us to do as we close today. God, I pray right now that you would search us. That we wouldn't just jump to the assumption that we're part of that 11% that's living the fullness of life that you have for us. But Lord, holiness is a harvest and some of us have never even started. Holiness is a process, and some of, us, some of us haven't even made that kind of surrender for that process to even begin. Holiness is spiritual, and it's practical, and some of us have asked you to do your thing, but we've never taken the responsibility to do our thing. And so, God, today I pray that you would search each and every one of us, God, I pray that you would challenge us. God, I know there are people in this room who this message should be encouraging for because it has been the experience of their life. And they had that holy discontent that led them to brokenness, that led them to surrender. They do profoundly love you. They do profoundly love others. Lord, today I pray that you would remove every ounce of conviction for those people in this place. But for the rest of us, which I will acknowledge includes me, I know there's still room to grow. I know that there's still work that you want to do. So God, I pray that today would be the moment for some of us. Today would be the the instantaneous part where we acknowledge where we are and we're honest about what we need. And that today would be the day when some of us would declare, God, I surrender to you. My past, my present, my future my sin, my hopes, my dreams, my accomplishment. I don't want to lead this thing anymore. I don't want to call the shots anymore. I want to experience the fullness of life that you have. God, we live in a world that doesn't have a high esteem for those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus. Because without holiness, no one will see God. And we want your love and life to be on display. We want your faithfulness and your goodness to be demonstrated to a world that desperately needs to see you. And I'm increasingly convinced that they're not going to see you because they visit a church service. They're going to see you because people who call you Savior and Lord begin to live with you on display through their life. Profound love for you. Profound love for your neighbor. Complete work of the Holy Spirit 
sanctifying us and making us holy. And God, we, we want to participate in that, but we can't produce that. So God, if you will produce that by the work of your Holy Spirit, may our answer to you be yes as we participate and live the disciplined, holy life that you have called us to. And may we find that it's better than we could have ever imagined. We love you today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.